Okay. This is the re-recording of recitation nine, question nine. I will not be doing question three, um, but I will be going over the breakdown of curve sketching really quickly before we get started. And so for number one, first thing that we're going to want to do is find some concrete points to sort of ground ourselves, ourselves with as we're working through this graph. And those first two points should be your X and Y intercepts. So what is X when F of X is equal to zero? And when X is equal to zero, what is F of X? Then we will move into some calculus and we'll find critical points. And we know that critical points are the X values where F prime of X is equal to zero. And please note that critical points refer only to the first derivative. If we were referring to the second derivative, we would ask you for an inflection point. So if on an exam, you're asked to find a critical point, um, you know that it, it is definitely referring to the first derivative, that X value when F prime of X is equal to zero, not the second derivative. So question or parts two, three, and four sort of go together. Um, next, we're going to classify our critical points um, because they are candidates for extrema as either maxima or minima if we have any. So if we have any critical points to begin with, um, then we will classify it as a max or a min. Um, and to do that, well, you can either do it by finding the function values, which we discussed in last week's recitation, or maybe it was the week before. Um, but what we're going to do today and what's going to be most useful is to put them on a number line using the intervals of increase and decrease to determine whether or not you're dealing with a max or a min. Um, and so we'll put f prime of x on a number line and we'll see to the left of that x value that we've determined as a critical point, when we plug into the equation of the derivative, is that positive, is that negative? If um, say we've got a critical point at a, so we know that its derivative here is zero and we find with our number line that the derivative to the left of a is negative and then it changes to positive to the right, then we know that we have a minimum. Now, the next couple go together in the same sense that two, three, and four do. Next, we're going to find our inflection points, which as I mentioned, are when the second derivative um, is equal to zero. So, the, and that indicates a change in concavity. So whether or not it's concave up, so this is concave up, and then this is concave down. And an, and an inflection point would be right about here where that changes. And so, like I said, the X values were F double prime of X are equal to zero, if there are any. Um, and then we're going to find our intervals of concavity using the same method. We'll put the second derivative on a number line and we'll plug in values to the left and right of that critical point. Um, and even if we don't have a specific critical point, say we, and even if we don't have, um, or excuse me, I misspoke, to the left and right of those inflection points. But even if we don't have critical points or inflection points, we're still going to evaluate whether or not the function is increasing or decreasing at all points or whether, or for all X values or whether or not the function is concave up or concave down for all X values. So even if we don't have a point where F prime of X is equal to zero, we're still, we're still interested in what information we can find from the first number line or from the first derivative number line. And the same goes for inflection points. Even if there are no um, concrete inflection points, we're still interested in the concavity of the function. And then lastly, we will bring up our old calculus from the first unit of the semester, and we will evaluate some limits to figure out if we have any horizontal or vertical asymptotes. Um, so for horizontal asymptotes, we're essentially evaluating end behavior. So if we think about a function that tends towards positive infinity like that, like a logarithmic function, that's end behavior. So the limit as X tends to positive infinity is equal to positive infinity in that case. So that's considered end behavior and that's considered a horizontal asymptote. There are times when um, the horizontal asymptote is not just simply infinity. Um, so it could be, so our horizontal asymptote, we could be getting closer and closer to the number 10. Say that this is 10 and we've got a function that looks like this, then the limit as X tends to positive infinity would be 10. And then when we're talking about vertical asymptotes, this is something we're a little bit more familiar with um, in the sense that we really just have to figure out if there are any possible points of irrationality. So more often than not, we're gonna see that as a zero in the denominator for when we're dealing with fractional polynomials. But when we're dealing with regular polynomials, like with this example three, which I'm not going to go over because um, the difference between example three and example nine really is that we'll be adding in um, uh, vertical asymptotes, horizontal and vertical asymptotes um, for question nine. And um, qu other than that, question three, all of the same concepts will be demonstrated in question nine. So we're just gonna focus on question nine since I had to re re-record this lecture. 
And so after we figure out whether or not we have any horizontal or vertical asymptotes, we'll start our sketch um, and we'll see what that looks like here shortly. All right, so number nine, like I said, is a fractional polynomial. Um, so we, and by that, I mean that we've got something in the denominator that's going to cause it to be irrational at some point. And so we note ahead of time that X is equal or cannot be equal to one. We will use that information, but I really just wrote this up here as sort of like a, a guide for your thought process. The first thing you should think when you look at this function is that there is a, there's a possibility for irrationality in the, there will be irrationality due to um, this X minus one term that we've got in the denominator. And as I often do, I have set this equation equal to F of X so that I can consistently label my functions. And so first thing that I'm going to do is bring up that old algebra. I'm going to figure out what my intercepts are. So let's say that X is equal to zero. What will F of X be equal to? We find that that is F of zero is equal to zero. Um, you could go, at, so for other examples, like for example, three, um, you, so what I'm getting at here is that the X and the Y intercept are the same. And so you don't have to do this calculation twice. You could double check yourself and see when is f of x equal to zero, what x corresponds to that, where you're gonna get the exact same answer. And so there's only one step for this first step number one, because the x and the y intercept are the same. And I have this highlighted here because when we get down to graphing, I'm going to rewrite my puzzle pieces if I'm thinking in terms of how we did our related rate problems, all the, all the pertinent information, I'm gonna bring it down to my graph. So I've got it all in one place. It's a little bit less overwhelming. So now we'll move into our calculus. We're going to find the first derivative, which is done using the quotient rule. And then when I simplify that, I get this here. Now, the first thing that I notice about this is so if the next step I know, so I'm, I'm trying to find a critical point here. That's the point. I'm trying to find where f prime of x is equal to zero. But since I've got the only x that I've got in f prime of x is in the denominator here, there's no way that this is going to be equal to zero. The way that we set a function equal to zero, the way that we find an x value that corresponds to a critical point is we look at the numerator and we think, okay, when is the numerator going to be equal to zero? If we were to set the denominator equal to zero, that would give us an irrationality. And so if there were an x in the numerator, then we would say that there's a critical point at x is equal to zero because we just have to plug in zero to the numerator in order to make the numerator zero. But there is no way to manipulate this fraction here such that it is equal to zero because no matter what, we're gonna have this constant in the numerator that is not equal to zero. And so there are no critical points for this function. There is no point at which f prime of x is equal to zero. So there are no maxima and there are no minima. But that doesn't mean that we're not still interested in whether or not the function is increasing or decreasing. And so we'll take a look at, we'll take another look here to see whether or not it's increasing or decreasing. So since we don't have a critical point to break it up, we can, we can assume that it's going to be either all increasing or all decreasing until we get later on into the problem. Um, but at this point, if you were doing the problem on your own, I would say you just assume that there's going to be one sign for the first rate of change. And by that, I mean, it's all going to be, in this case, negative. So the function is going to be decreasing for all values of x. So f of x is de decreasing on negative infinity to infinity. These are all of our x values. Um, so this is another piece of highlighted information that we're going to bring down when we do our graph at the end. So moving on to inflection points. So before we even talk about inflection points, thinking about the fact that we have no critical points, that means we're probably not going to have any inflection points. So if you remember the doodle that I put up before to represent an inflection point, inflections come from change in concavity. And if there's no change in the first derivative, we're probably not gonna get a change in concavity. So we go from being positive, first having f prime of x be greater than zero to having f prime of x be less than zero. And we have that change here by the intermediate value theorem. If we're going from positive to negative, we must cross zero. But if we take this change here, if we completely eliminate this and there is no critical point, then there's no opportunity for there to be an inflection point. And so before we're even getting into finding the inflection points, we're kind of thinking ahead on what this graph might look like based off of the information that we've already accumulated. And we know that there probably aren't going to be any inflection points. And so we'll take the, so I've rewritten the first derivative here. I've done a fractional power manipulation, or I've done a power manipulation to make it easier to do the power rule when I take the second derivative here, which when simplified is very similar to the last equation in the sense 
that we have a constant in the numerator and there's no opportunity for it to be equal to zero. And so again, we have no inflection points because f double prime of x cannot be equal to zero. And we'll come back to the second derivative number line here in a second. So before I mentioned, if you were doing this on your own, at this point, you would just assume that for all x values, it's going to be the same first derivative sign, that f prime of x is going to be negative and f of x is going to be decreasing for all x values. And the reason I said that is because we're also, if I were doing this problem and I got to step five, six on my own, um, without having seen what the graph looked like, I would probably assume again that it's going to be the same um, inflection or that the um, concavity is going to be the same for the entire function. But since we are dealing with irrationalities and we're going to be looking at horizontal and vertical asymptotes, we are not going to use our critical points in this case or our flexion, inflection points in this case, excuse me, to guide where there are changes in concavity, if any we're going to be looking at our horizontal and vertical asymptotes, which is why I'm saying that we'll come back to this. But similar to when we were doing our related rate problems, say you were going through the problem and you forgot to do some sort of substitution, like say they gave you information in terms of diameter instead of radius, and you didn't do that substitution at the beginning, that's fine. Because as you go throughout the problem, you'll come to realize that you're missing something or that something's not adding up. And that's when you'll backtrack. And that's when we'll come back to um, this part five, six here. So if um, what I'm saying here is, if, is if, if you don't have the foresight to recognize, okay, maybe these vertical and horizontal asymptotes are going to change this, that's fine. Do it as though it feel, do it how it feels natural. And then as you get later into the problem, you'll realize that something's missing and that's where we're gonna come back and take a second look. So like I said, we're gonna move into our asymptotes. So for vertical asymptotes, we're just gonna set the denominator equal to zero, which is going to give us x equal to one as a vertical asymptote. This is how you write the equation of a vertical asymptote. Um, and then looking at horizontal asymptotes. So we're going to evaluate to find horizontal asymptotes, our end behavior, the limit as x tends to positive infinity and the limit as x tends to negative infinity. Those are the two that we're concerned with because that is what end behavior is. And so we're just gonna plug in infinity wherever we see an x value. So what we get is infinity over infinity minus one. So as far as the concept of larger and smaller infinities go, that is pertinent here, but really the difference between these two infinities is so small because one in the grand scheme of infinity does not have any bearing on like the general magnitude of this infinity. And so basically we can say that this infinity and this infinity minus one, since they're so large and this negative one here does so little to affect the general value of this infinity, we can say that we're basically dividing two of the same infinity by infinity being equal to one. Um, and I think what I'm gonna do after I finish this problem is I'll go up to step seven for question three and just talk about those limit assessments really quickly because it is different from this. But we'll do the same thing again for the limit as x tends to negative infinity. And it really, again, it doesn't change much. So we get negative infinity over negative infinity because if we subtract one from negative infinity, it really isn't going to change the value. And so these two, the numerator and the denominator can be said to be relatively equal. And so again, our um, horizontal asymptote is gonna be equal to one. And so these two values here are going to be very helpful in guiding um, what our graph looks like later on. So now we're coming back to six. Now let's consider the concavity, concavity to the left and the right of a vertical asymptote. We're not gonna do it from the left and the right of the horizontal asymptote because that's on top and on bottom. We don't deal with functions on top and bottom of asymptotes. We go from, um, maybe not always left and right, but we deal with, um, so if our function is in terms of X, we're concerned with X, we're concerned with going down a number line left to right. And so if we've got a vertical asymptote that breaks up our X number line, that's gonna be what is our sort of our stand in distinction since we have no critical points or inflection points. Um, and so what that looks like is we're going to find what f prime of zero. So we've determined that we have this vertical asymptote at one. And so what are some easy values to plug in and figure out what the concavity to the left and to the right are? We're going to plug in um, f, we're going to plug in zero to f double prime. And then when that is simplified, we get that it's negative. And so the function is going to be concave down 
from negative infinity to one open brackets because we cannot be equal to infinity close brackets represents inclus inclusion and we can't include negative infinity because we don't know where infinity is. Um, and we can't include one because that would make it irrational and so that's it's open brackets for this and now we're going to choose two because it's another easy whole number that's to the right of our um, vertical asymptote and we get that the function is concave up because our second derivative is greater than zero now to backtrack um the if this so what i was getting at earlier is if you don't have the foresight to maybe recognize that these vertical asymptotes could have a bearing on what the concavity is that's okay because once you get to this point once you realize that there is something to block to break it up that's when you would take a second you take a second thought and think okay is it possible that i was incorrect in my original assumption that there was only one for, or that the sign of the second derivative is going to be the same for all parts and it's a very easy test to figure out whether or not you were right or wrong if you think the same thing about the first derivative if you're thinking okay i assumed that it was going to be decreasing on negative infinity to infinity but could i be wrong should i check to the left and the right of this boundary here again it's a very easy calculation and to do these problems it's definitely not it wouldn't be frowned upon to do extra work if it's just helping to sort of build this portfolio of what this graph looks like in your head that being said if you're going to do a bunch of extra work to make sure and to double check yourself i would definitely put circles or boxes around the most important information so that you can consolidate it later on like i've done here so we've got this concrete point here f of zero equal to zero which off the bat that's going to be one of the first things that we want to graph because that's going to get that's going to guide us we have no critical points or inflection points um so that's not necessarily something that i we would expect you to write down but if it's something that um is helpful to remind you then by all means write down what you think is helpful um we know that the function is going to be concave down and decreasing on negative infinity to one but I'm getting ahead of myself because we need to include our horizontal asymptote before we write anything like that. Before we start trying to um, draw the graph of, of the function, including its concavity. So looking at this point here, we know it's concave down and decreasing on negative infinity to one. So we're talking to the left of this function, right? So or to the left of this asymptote, excuse me. And we have this point here in the origin. So we know that to the left of this asymptote, if we have two options, it can either be above the horizontal asymptote or it can be be or, um, below the horizontal asymptote, that we know that the function is gonna have to be down here in the third quadrant. Well, it's gonna come up a little bit into the first, but it's gonna be in this area here. Um, we could also figure that out based off of the fact that it's con um, concave down and decreasing. Um, just because there's no way that it could be concave down and decreasing and come up, come up with these um, asymptotes in the if we were to put this aspect of the function up here. That being said, you can just plug in values and double check if you're not sure. Um, so I know that this graph looks like this. So for me, it's a little I, I have the foresight to be able to see this having looked at the graph before. But when you're doing this for the first time, it's not always as easy to visualize, even though you've got all of your concrete points here, it's not always as easy to visualize what it looks like. And so it's perfectly reasonable to fact, to fact check yourself. Um, and so if you were not sure whether or not based off of if you were second guessing yourself and your understanding of where the function had to lie to the right of this asymptote, um, based off of its concavity and its first derivative, whether or not it was increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down, just plug in a function value and you'll find that that function value is going to be up in this area. And then it'll be a lot easier to fill in the blanks from there because that's what that's sort of the name of the game with these graphing functions. You've got to find your concrete points and fill in the blanks in between. And so since, so I didn't plug in a value, but if you wanted to, you could. Um, based off of the fact that it's concave up and decreasing, I know that I'm going to have to be up in this area here. And it's going to follow those asymptotes, asymptotes um, being a concrete piece of information that I know is going to hold true. And I'm just sort of going to sort of fill in the blanks from there. Um, so there's really not a whole lot that I didn't unveil over here. So this, um, I'm honestly going to erase this whole thing here because I realize now that this is not simply the third quadrant um this this here is true because it must be in the first quadrant because we've got our asymptotes that are going to lock it in here but that's not necessarily true for this aspect of the function over here um but what i've written over here is that you can plug in values to determine where the function is going to lie if you are unsure um and all i've got written down here is another or just a cleaner version of the graph um 
just wasn't sure how well it was going to go when I was drawing it with my laptop, but looks pretty fine to me. Um, and that's, that's that for graphing number nine. Um, I'm going to go up to number three and talk about the difference between um, this problem, number nine and number three, in terms of evaluating these horizontal asymptotes, specifically the concept of larger and smaller infinities. So in this case, the difference between infinity and infinity minus one was so insignificant that it's basically negligible. And we consider this infinity and infinity minus one to be equal. And therefore, when we divide them, we get this asymptote to be equal to one. It's different up here because we're dealing with, where'd it go? There we go. So um, off the bat, so this is our function here. We've just got a normal polynomial. So x to the fourth minus four x, there's nothing in the denominator. You can plug in any x value in the rational x, or you can plug in any rational x value and you will get a rational output. And so we don't have to concern ourselves with vertical asymptotes. Polynomials are sort of a, a gimme. When you see polynomials, um, like when we're talking about maybe the MBT, you know that things are going to be simpler and there's um, it's going to be more straightforward. Um, but when we're talking about horizontal asymptotes, so again, we're just going to plug in infinity. But the difference between this one and the last one is, so when we subtract and we add, we're really not changing the magnitude of this infinity. So we can't say with finite absolute, we can't say absolutely what this value, well, how big this infinity is. Um, but we do know that it's infinity times infinity times infinity times infinity, which has gotta be a great deal bigger than four times infinity. So what I'm saying here is, is when we've put this to the power of four, even though these infinities are such large values that we can't put a finite value on them, there still exists this concept of larger and smaller infinities as abstract as it may be. And so if we multiply infinity by itself four times, that's gonna be a lot bigger than if we multiply infinity by four. And so when we subtract four infinity from infinity to the fourth, we don't, so we were really only considering the concept of larger and smaller infinities while we're doing this calculation. So our answer here is just going to be infinity. But while we're considering relatively infinity to the fourth minus four infinity, what would that value be? We're gonna, we're gonna represent that as a big infinity minus a, a small infinity. So basically what we take away from this is we're not going to go into negative infinity. If it were small infinity minus large infinity, then the answer would be negative infinity. But um, since we have this infinity to the fourth and we're subtracting it by infinity times four, we know that our final answer is just going to be infinity. And that's what I wanted to get at with this concept of larger and smaller infinities and how to evaluate these um, mm -hmm. relatively, because ultimately our answer is going to be infinity. And we don't care, we're not saying that this answer here is a large infinity or it is a small infinity. We're not qualifying our answer in that sense. We're qualifying the intermediate steps as larger and smaller infinities in order to figure out what this, whether or not this final answer is going to be infinity or negative infinity. And so we'll do the same thing here. We plug in and again, it makes no difference. We have infinity, negative infinity times negative infinity times negative infinity times negative infinity, which again is going to just give us a large infinity. Those negative signs are gonna cancel out and it's again, infinity to the fourth. And then we're going to add for infinity, which again, does very little to change the outcome. We're still, our answer is still infinity. And so I say we have no horizontal asymptotes um, and that's, I don't think that that's a, a great way of putting it, but basically our, our, end, our end behavior is such that the function is going to continue out following these asymptotes. We don't know whether or not the function, um, so at this point, just having looked at this, we wouldn't know whether or not the function was coming from above or below, but we do know that the function would kiss up against this x axis and that it would go on in, to infinity as x tended towards infinity. And that was the big point I wanted to make about evaluating these limits, especially since we haven't talked about limits really um, in a while since the first unit of the semester. Um, and so I guess it wouldn't hurt to just compare it again. So again, if we're plugging in infinity here and then infinity in the denominator and we're subtracting by one relatively, their relative magnitude has not changed. And so we're regarding these infinities as equal because relatively they basically are, when we're dealing with a, a number that is so large that we can't put a finite value on it, if we subtract one from it, who does, who cares? 
And so relative to each other, they're equal. And so our horizontal asymptote in this case is equal to one. All right. <clears throat> 